Hello and welcome to the Women in Motorsport program. I'm Isha Azim from Racing with Isha. And with me, we have Ben Schneider from Grid Live Encore and LastCore.info, as well as Emily Sharp. As always, a big thank you to our Patreon investors, Colin, Dishell, Mark, Robin, David, and Matthew. Your investment in the Grid Network, no matter the size, plays a crucial role in our mission to promote women in motorsport. You can make a difference by clicking on the link in the video description. Or you can always opt to do a one-time investment through Buy Me A Coffee or YouTube Super Chats. $10 by Super Chat or Buy Me A Coffee, and we will mail you some fun Grid Network stickers. Now, community, join us today in receiving the latest updates and exclusive content in the motorsport world. So we'll, sh we'll start off today's show by talking about Catherine Legg in the Indy 500. So, the 108th running of the Indianapolis 500 is this weekend, and Catherine Legg is in the field for the second consecutive year. She is with Dale Coyne Racing this year, and she had to go through the last row shootout. Legg has been to the Indy 500 before at the Rolex 24 and NASCAR Xfinity, and she is now in her fourth Indy 500. She called her qualifying run one of her career's most difficult. All of her Indy 500 teams or starts have been with smaller teams like Dragon Racing in 2012, Schmidt-Peterson Motorsport 2013 before McLaren's involvement, and last year, Rahal letterman Lanigan Racing, where she was the best of the team in qualifying. Now this year, her Dale Coyne Racing teammate, Nolan Siegel, failed to qualify for the race. So Emily, Ben, I want to ask you guys, her best finish is 22nd with Dragon Racing. What do you guys think we can expect from her this weekend? Well, first and foremost, I just have to say, I just love the look of that pink elf cosmetics car. And it's always just such a great opportunity to be able to watch Catherine out on the track. So we are very excited to have her back for another year. Um, so with that being said, um, I, I do want to start with the positives that she is back um, for the first time um, consecutively. Uh, prior to that, she had a 10-year absence from the IndyCar series. And of course, last year's race absolutely did not end as she wanted it to with that really unfortunate pit lane incident um, and she had to end up retiring the car early so the positive from last year though was that she was the quickest uh, car in qualifying amongst her teammates with Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan so this year primarily what we are all hoping for with Catherine is one that she brings the car across um, for that checkered flag um, but Unfortunately, with Dale Coyne racing, I, I think those Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan cars who are her prime competitors, I would say for this year's running, they've sorted out a lot of their pace issues. So I think that, again, we want to see her cross that start finish line um, and complete all of the laps. Uh, but I think it's going to be a struggle with her pace. I did find her qualifying a, a, a challenge, as she had mentioned, and in post qualifying interview, she's kind of alluded that any adjustments are to her car rather than to any strategy. So we're all very hopeful for her. But um, again, I think what we can expect is for her wanting to finish the race. Yeah, well, to your point, Emily, of course, there's really nowhere to go from up, but but up from last year, uh, you know, obviously with how the race uh, ended for her and uh, what happened earlier in the week with her crash with uh, Stephen Wilson, which I think she took it and incredibly unfair amount of, of blame for. I think that was just a racing incident that unfortunately took him out of uh, the weekend. But, uh, you know, she had to deal with that. And then obviously dealing with uh, what, what happened in the pits during the race and uh, retiring the car much earlier than uh, she would have liked to be able to, to bring the car home in one piece. So I think that's ultimately first and foremost to go for her this year is run all the laps, finish up the lead lap. I think top 20 would be a great day for her. Um, again, you have to remember she's driving for a significantly smaller team where you know, the resources can't be compared to the Penske's, Ganassi's, Andretti's, and McLaren's of the world. You know, Dale Coyne Racing historically has won races. They've done a lot with a little, but I think given their pace in qualifying, obviously her teammate Nolan Siegel is the only one uh, who got bumped and didn't qualify for the race this year. So uh, you have to keep your expectations in check. But then again, this is Indianapolis. You never know if it comes down to a late uh, fuel mileage run. I don't know if she can win the race, but I think, you know, if she could play her strategy right, Maybe something like a top 15 or even a top 10 wouldn't be out of the question for her. But first and foremost, the goal needs to be to be in position to possibly take advantage of that and run all the laps and finish this race. Yep, definitely. Now with that, let us take a look at some stats. So nine women have started the Indianapolis 500, and this is Catherine's fourth start. So it ties her with Anna Beatriz, and her best finish was 13th in the Indy 500. Now, in the past, we used to see multiple women start the Indy 500, but most of them 
or not with a full-time ride. Beatrice and Indy Lights had two wins, third in the 2008 standings, but only had one full-time season in IndyCar with Dreyer and Rainbold Racing. Now, Ben, I want to start with you for this question. So we have Jamie Chadwick in Indy next, potentially a spot for her next year. But does having a full-time ride serve as an advantage compared to the Indy 500 and maybe a handful of other races as well? Well, I think absolutely. When you have a full season program, obviously you, you, it gives you time to develop uh, chemistry with your team and your your crew and everything. And, uh, you know, gives you the chance to have a few races under your belt. Obviously, uh, you know, the way the schedule is right now, maybe that's not as important as it was in previous years because, you know, we, we don't have uh, the only other uh, kind of super speedway style oval that we've had in recent years has been Texas. And of course I dropped off the schedule this year. So I think for young drivers in particular, like Jamie Chadwick, um, you know, you do have some ovals like uh, Gateway and Milwaukee coming back in Iowa, of course. Um, but to not have the Freedom 100, especially, I think, you know, for these Indy Next drivers, uh, really doesn't do a great job of preparing them for the next level. And maybe that uh, lack of experience is part of what caught Nolan Siegel out this year. But uh, you know, I, I think when, when you talk about being full time, of course, it, it's obviously a massive benefit. But uh, the counter to that and, if, you know, uh, you, should, you brought up Dreyer and Reinbold, you know, that's another team that I'm sure would love to be full time again. But the way that just where their resources are right now, they have chosen to go all in on this one race per year rather than trying to stretch things out over a full time season. And it seems to work out for them. Ryan Hunter Ray even made uh, the fast 12 this year. So, uh, you know, different uh, strategies, I suppose, with teams with limited resources and budgets can can work differently for different teams. But uh, I would say, you know, for, for most drivers, I I'm sure you would rather have a full-time uh, program put together. And uh, we'll keep monitoring uh, Jamie's progress this year in Indy Next. Hopefully, uh, she's got a good development plan lined up and we could potentially see her full-time in IndyCar, if not in 25, uh, maybe in 26. And we'll see how she could do with the 500 one day as well. Yeah, and absolutely, Ben. I agree with all of your points. Uh, you know, I, I think we've talked about it several times here on this show. The more opportunities and time drivers have behind the wheel and out on the tracks, like the results usually mirror that in a positive manner. Um, and we would all love to see that pink car and Catherine behind it year round in this series. But uh, to, to add on to your Ana Beatrice example, Isha, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but Simona Di Silvestro in one of her full time seasons, Back in 2010, she ended up finishing 14th in her Indy 500 outing. So again, it's just another example of the more opportunities, the better practice, and the more consistent performance is performances these drivers put in. And I too would love to see uh, Jamie with a full-time ride out in the NTT IndyCar series as well. And for multiple reasons, not only for her own uh, success and her team's success, but it's good for the series and racing fans in general. She's become one of the more popular drivers. And it's just only going to be to her benefit as well as her team and sponsors behind her to have her more visible. And again, it's drawing more fans in to enjoy the series as a whole. So I think uh, with what Catherine is potentially able to do this weekend, it should be a good strong campaign of why we need to continue to give these female drivers more opportunities and further more full-time opportunities. Yep, definitely. And now if we take a look ahead, this is a friendly reminder that Sunday is our Indy 500 pre-race show. So Emily, Jessica, Kobe, and Joe will be there covering it. And with that, Emily, let's now go to the ARCA East Racing in Michigan. Thank you so much, Isha. So Flat Rock Speedway hosted the Arkham Menard Series East Dutch Boy 150. Tony Breidinger and Rita Goulet both were in the field of 16. Goulet finished 14, 10 laps down in the number 31 Chevrolet. Breidinger came home fourth, the final car on the lead lap, and Ben was behind some of the big names. Connor Zilch, the race winner, may see, uh, see as a NASCAR prospect. William Solik in second place, Joe Gibb Racing. Giovanni Ruggiero is in third place. He won earlier this year. Ben, Tony is coming off of a top 10 at Kansas and a top five at Flat Rock. How would you rate her compared to this point last year? I think she's about in the same area uh, where she was last year in terms of her performance and uh, where she is on her stages of uh, development as an ARCA driver. I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit uh of a, more of a step forward this year, but of course her, her season got off to uh, not such a great start with uh, the controversy with her teammate at Daytona and being taken out uh, in, in that race as well as the truck race that weekend. Uh, so it wasn't a great start to be year for, and sometimes that can rob you of your uh, momentum. But, you know, she had a solid run 
at Flat Rock this past weekend. You know, fourth place finish, her best career finish in ARCA East. Obviously, she had the third at, at Kansas last year in ARCA National, so not quite her career best in all of ARCA, but still a, a solid run nonetheless. But again, uh, you know, there's always a caveat there, but the car counts uh, down a little bit. This was the last standalone East race of the year, so uh, she, we, we expect uh, Tony, you know, running full time in ARCA to run. The remainder of the East schedule, which of course uh, is just ARCA National Series races anyway, so uh, there'll be some more competition for it, which I think only benefits everybody when you have more uh, drivers out there to continue to, you know, measure yourself against and uh, hone your own uh, skill uh, over the rest of the season here. So I think she's doing a solid job, but again, I think there's still uh, another gear to be unlocked. You know, I, I think she's certainly an equipment uh, that's capable of uh, of winning races and uh, competing. Uh, for top fives, you know, every single weekend. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to continue to see that become an even more regular occurrence uh, than it has for her over the last uh, year and a half or so. And again, I want to be clear, she has taken a, a massive step forward uh, from where she was in 2022 and uh, earlier in, in her ARCA career. But again, you're driving for Venturini, the goal and expectation is to win. And I know she knows that, uh, but, you know, I, I think there is still a, another gear to be unlocked before we can put that in as a, as a realistic expectation for. I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, upcoming this weekend, Arca is at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, and she has placed 12th and 11th in the last two races here. Tony, along with Amber, who has a top 10 at Charlotte in 2022, is in the field of 31 drivers. Both of them are here with Rainy Motorsports. Do you anticipate the top 10 finish for both of them? Yeah, Amber Balkan, uh, her, her teammate with uh, Venturini. Um, she is uh, she's going to be back with uh, you know obviously the the injury to her foot still. I know that she said it, it isn't uh, healing as quickly as uh, she would have liked from the unfortunate incident at Dover. But uh, again, you know Charlotte being a mile and a half, there's not as much uh, breaking that you need to do uh, that track compared to some others. Like if we were going to a road course this weekend, uh, you know I think uh, you know it'd be a lot tougher for Amber to try to <clears throat> excuse me to try to gut it out and uh, race with with the injury that she has. But you know she. Uh, She's done an admirable job uh, soldiering on here. And, uh, you know, Tony Bridinger, like we were just talking about, I think, uh, you know, it's taken a step forward on the mile and a half. So I would think uh, top 10 should definitely be the goal for, for both of them, if not maybe uh, even a little bit higher than that in the top five. So uh, we'll see. Obviously, there's going to be more uh, competition. I think almost double the uh, the car count that we saw at the East Race at Flat Rock this past weekend. So I'm um, looking forward to the ARCA racing this weekend. of All of our uh, national series uh, on, on a great weekend for motorsports here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. It's going to be fun to watch. Absolutely. And we're going to be excited to watch it. As a reminder, the General Tire 150 is Friday at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Ben will recap it on Grid Encore with Brandon Crossland. Uh, so Isha, let's go ahead and cover dirt track racing and Kaylee Bryson. Yes, thank you, Emily. So 23-year-old Kaylee Bryson made more history over at the USAC competition. In the 54-year history of the USAC Silver Crown event, she became the first female driver to qualify on pole. Now, she then went on to win and become the first woman to win a USAC National Series feature. Last year, she was also the first woman to earn Rookie of the Year honors in a national division. And in 2022, she was the first female driver to qualify for the A-Main feature in the Chili Bowl. Ben, she races sprint cars, late models, and has the support of Toyota. And she wants to excel in racing no matter what series. So considering the Toyota support, the USAC, um, late models, do you think she's on the way to a potential ARCA spot in the next couple of years? I think it depends on what she wants to do with her career. And I've said that multiple times on this show. I think, you know, her career path could take a number of different directions. I, I think she's teased uh, wanting to maybe go down the IndyCar path before. Obviously, her relationship with Toyota makes uh, NASCAR or, you know, an ARCA deal with Venturini an obvious option for her as well. But uh, one thing that is 100% uh, certain is that Kaylee Bryson has a lot of talent behind the wheel of a race car, and uh, this is just further proof of that. We've talked about it uh, multiple times on this show before, uh, so I think whatever whatever her future holds for her, uh, I, I have no doubt she's going to find success. It's just a matter of choosing the right path and figuring out what she wants to do with the rest of her career, and of course, she's still very young. She's got a lot of time to uh, map that out and plan that out for her, uh, but I think absolutely at this point, if Venturini or Toyota wanted to put her in one of their cars, I think she's absolutely earned an opportunity like that. So I think, again, given her relationship with Toyota, that would be an obvious career path for her. But, you know, again, you know, with the USAC background, maybe there's an, an IndyCar opportunity somewhere in there as well. So we'll just have to wait and see. But it's going to be interesting to see uh, where her career uh, goes here over these next couple of seasons. 
Yep, she definitely has plenty of time to still map out her future options. And with that, let's bring Emily into the discussion now. So we know this weekend is the Indianapolis 500. We discussed earlier on how we've seen the number of women in the race shrink recently. So one of the most popular drivers, Danica Patrick, switched over to NASCAR. Now, NASCAR has the Drive for Diversity program and has seen more female drivers, but no full-time drivers in the top series, the NASCAR Cup Series. So Emily, starting with you, for a young female racer racing ovals in the United States, does an IndyCar route or a NASCAR route have a more promising prospect? Yeah, so in all transparency, Isha, I don't think either series necessarily has the perfect roadmap for a young female driver. Uh, certainly Danica's NASCAR career, depending on what part you are looking at, can be remembered for sheer moments of brilliance um, and potentially big disappointments. Um, overall, I would say her career in IndyCar was marked by more successes than it was while she was running in the Cup Series in her NASCAR time. Um, and her first win was, uh, her first win was at an Oval in the IndyCar Series. So from that perspective, I would lean towards the IndyCar series. However, um, I, as someone who attended the Woman with Drive Summit and had the opportunity to hear Steve Phelps in person share his dedication and commitment to creating a more inclusive environment within the NASCAR organization, I have a lot of faith that that organization is making it a priority. And certainly with their driver diversity program, I do feel like NASCAR is making it a priority to bring more women into the fold. So with all of that, that being said, um, I do think that there, you know, there is great prospect. And in the next few years, I, I do believe that we are going to see women driving full time within that organization um, just because they are creating an infrastructure for that to succeed and be successful. Um, so we are just going to have to wait and find out. Um, but in a perfect scenario, I hope both of them turn out to be uh, the best opportunity for women to be receiving more full time opportunities, especially on oval tracks. You know, right now, I would say it's, it's you know, to Emily's point, it's probably, uh, you know, neither IndyCar or NASCAR. It's probably more like the NHRA or, you know, Monster Jam has a lot of female competitors. Uh, sports car racing, obviously, with the Iron Dames, you know, there's there's a lot of different options out there. But if we had to limit it to just these two, which I think, you know, getting back to Kaylee Bryson would be her two most likely uh, future paths for her career. I think it's really a toss up at this point. You know, obviously, Jamie Jadwick just broke a 14 year stretch with no a female driver on the Indy Lights slash Indy Next podium, which I think, you know, if you had told somebody that we were going to go that long in, you know, the late 2000s, early 2010s, you know, when you had Pippa Mann and Anna Beatrice, uh, you know, in that series coming up through the IndyCar ranks, Simona De Silvestro, another one that I think, you know, maybe didn't get uh, enough of a full-time opportunity in the IndyCar series to show what she could do. Um, you know, I, I think that that would have surprised a lot of people, but it's 2024 and here we are. Danica Patrick's always been a very interesting a career case for me because, you know, Kevin Harvick even, I think, said this on Happy Hour on his old uh, Sirius XM show uh, several years back. He had a 20-year advantage over Danica Patrick when it came to NASCAR Cup Series racing. And, you know, Danica could have developed, uh, you know, her skill, you know, much faster than she did in the NASCAR Cup Series, making that transition over. That's something that, you know, it was a matter of time that she just couldn't make up over, you know, her Stuart Haas racing teammates. And so that's the disadvantage when you start down one path and then the fame and fortune of stock car racing nascar was still kind of at the tail end of its boom period when danica made the switch over you know it, it fell to that temptation if you will i think that her career might be remembered uh certainly would be remembered differently might be remembered for being even better than it was if she had uh stayed in indycar or if she had come over to nascar and spent uh, a couple more years in the nationwide slash Xfinity series of junior motorsports before being rushed up uh, to Cup. So I think that, you know, either one could produce a promising uh, path for a young driver, uh, you know, but I think in, in terms of looking at Danica's career, I'd like to see that driver stick with whichever path they choose. So if if Kaylee Bryson's in an ARCA car for Venturini for the next couple of years and then, you know, gets a truck or Xfinity ride beyond that, I, I think that that should be the series that she uh, chooses at least you know for the foreseeable future i don't know maybe she blossoms into a kyle larson kind of superstar and then runs the double one day i'd have uh, no problem with that at all but i think that you know trying to i think danica was really just starting to get established as a household name in the indycar series and uh you know that was right when she made the transition over to nascar and left that part of her career behind 
and just could never quite capture that same magic. Emily, to your point, you know, she sat on pole at Daytona and, you know, had some good runs here or there, but there's no denying that her NASCAR career did not live up to the hype that her IndyCar career did uh, in many respects, winning a race uh, in, in Japan and, you know, being a legitimate uh, contender on a weekly basis for a couple of years in that Andretti car. So, uh, you know, again, I think it, it's a toss up in terms of which could be the more uh, promising, more lucrative uh, sort of deal for somebody like Kaylee Bryson. But I think whichever path she chooses, she's got to stick with, because if you try to make that career change halfway through your career, you know, in, in Danica, I think is, is further proof of that. It's it's just very hard to make make that work in the same way that, you know, you, you could succeed in just choosing one series and sticking with it for the rest of your career. Yep, definitely. Those were great thoughts from you both, Emily and Ben. Now with that, let us bring Joe in to go over our busy weekend plans over here at the Grid Network. Very busy weekend for all motorsports fans. Of course, this is the weekend we've all talked about the Christmas for the motorsports fans. It is Memorial Day weekend in the United States. Everyone else, they know it as, of course, the big weekend for Monaco Grand Prix Formula One. And Saturday, noon Eastern, our Grid Life pre-race will preview the Monaco Grand Prix, recap the Formula E race in Shanghai, China. MotoGP, we got a sprint race to recap and preview the NASCAR Cup Series, Coca-Cola 600. Now, for those new to us, you're wondering, where's the Indianapolis 500? Sunday. Indianapolis 500 pre-race show will be following the conclusion of the Monaco Grand Prix. So be sure to subscribe to us right here. We're going to be previewing everything for the Indianapolis 500. And then a busy Monday, Monday noon Eastern Grid Life wrap-up recapping all of those races. And then Ben will be back on the air with Grid Encore to recap some more races. Of course, we'll be adjusting the schedule as needed with weather. We'll be following that. So be sure to subscribe to the Grid Network right here on YouTube. Hit that bell icon so you don't miss any programs, any updates throughout the race weekend. Follow us on social media, Twitter, threads. We're going to be posting updates as well too this weekend. And the best thing you could do to invest in our company, go to our link to Patreon, comment the show. Mark, Rob, and David Matthew have invested in us for many months. You two can join them. You'll get some Grid Network stickers sent out to you in the mail. And if you want to do a one-time investment, buy me a coffee, YouTube Super Chat. If you're watching any of our programs that's not live on the air, there's a thanks button. You can hit that to show your support for all of us here at The Grid Network. For Emily, Isha, and Ben, I'm Joe. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time, and enjoy the races. <laughs>